Hello. Uh, today is all about chapter three, which is where to do your work. So for example, a lot of teachers would promote using the notebook as a place for students to do their work. Um, this actually has a lot of downsides to it. So for example, um, you may, as a student, carry some baggage from like previous classes where maybe a notebook experience wasn't as positive for you because there was a lot of note taking or homework or whatever the problem was. So you bring that baggage with you. And then also um, with notebook use and traditionally you would have used it to do things like take notes and do things like these mimicking homework questions which is repetitive and so it just promotes that mimicking behavior that we're trying to move away from so his big recommendation is to go to non-permanent surfaces um ideally vertical and i'll talk about that in a second so uh, one of the products that i love is these white books so they are massive flip charts they come in packs of 10 i think for about 60 bucks and they're pretty they do hold up like i've had them for my classroom for two years now and they've held up. I don't use them daily, but I will try that soon. Cool thing about white books for us science folks is it's grids on one side, blank on the other. So for graphing relationships, especially in like physics, that's really easy to be done um, with the white books. So that's a really great surface. The reason why they like whiteboards the best I don't remember where the research is, but I know I've come across it that for some reason, pencil on paper isn't considered by most people to be non-permanent. Like it doesn't have an it's erasable, but for some reason, psychologically, you don't feel like it's erasable. But working on like a blackboard or window markers or a whiteboard with those markers, for some reason, there's something psychological where it feels not permanent. So you're more willing to take risks. So whiteboards are the way to go um, or blackboards or whatever you have in your classroom. This is going to pose the biggest hiccup, I think, for science teachers because um, there's a ton of evidence on vertical spaces, and there's really great um, research out there, vertical non-permanent spaces, or VNPS, if you wanted to look into it deeper. Um, so for example, uh, body language is seen easily when you're vertical. Um, as a teacher, you can scan the room and see what every group is doing uh, when it's vertical. The collective mind of the class helps. So when a group gets stuck, they can take a peek at what other people are doing. And then while some people may be like, well, that's just copying and that doesn't help. Actually, what it does, because as a teacher, you're going around to groups and being like, okay, walk me through your solution here. What was your thinking here? Why did you decide to do this? And as you're asking those questions, they're gonna have to explain themselves. So students will look at other groups that got, so if you got stuck, you go look at someone else's group work and you're like, Oh, that's what they did. And then you have to think about, okay, so as a group, think, why did they do that? Why does that make sense? Where did they get the, from that kind of stuff? So it promotes that thinking behavior. So actually a collective group brain is actually really helpful for the learning of the class and that thinking classroom. So um, vertical non-permanent surfaces are great, but in science, we have really deep cabinets and really deep lab benches. So for me, out of my four walls, I have one that's accessible for vertical spaces and in a class of 35, it just won't work. Great news is though, is that horizontal spaces do work. It's not great. You're gonna have to get the kids to stay and kind of lean over the desks or lean over um, the, the lab benches or whatever system you have, um, but you should get pretty good results. It won't be as good as the vertical, but you will still get some really good results out of that. So that's the one thing that's a little bit disappointing. I did just see a tweet from Peter though, that he is promoting a new book in September about how to run this in like hybrid classrooms or when we're restricted in how we set up our classrooms with like table placements because of covid um if you're online like how do you how do you run these like collaborative groups and, and how do you set these up if you do not have vertical surfaces available so there might be some nuggets in there for us to use in science classroom to kind of get around that issue um other really cool thing that i didn't think about so i've always been a teacher who had a bin of markers um, with the whiteboards to encourage colors and various uses and, and different kind of strategies and different writers and different contributors but actually what you should be doing is one marker per group because this means that it forces them to not just be um, three people working in parallel on the same whiteboard. It's one, like a team working as it. And in order to encourage um, it not just being like one person running through it, you can have a couple different things. So for example, um, as a teacher, if you see like one person kind of taking off and the other people sitting back passively, you can go up to the group, grab the marker, write some stuff down on the board, and then hand the marker to a different group member. You can have a timer so that every like three minutes or so, or whatever time you decide, you pass the marker. Or my favorite one that they suggested is the person doing the talking cannot do the writing. So then you have to explain yourself in a way that someone can write it down and, and communicate and get to that mastery level, which is massive in skills-based classrooms. So yeah, that was chapter three.